Okay, I'm going to go over three ways that you can experimentally measure the coefficient of friction for a block. Uh, so this is really just mostly fun. I wouldn't use this for uh, any real purposes, but it would make a great physics lab. Okay, so let's just get started. So if I have uh, a block sitting on a surface, uh, then I can, I can think about what forces would be acting on that block. The first thing I obviously have is the downward gravitational force. Uh, and on the surface of the Earth, we say that's equal to mass times the gravitational field, g. Cool. Uh, and then since the block doesn't accelerate up or down, there's a normal force pushing up. We call that n. And then imagine that I push it. Actually, I'd be pushing it this way, right? I'm pushing it this way with some force. I call that fp. And if the block doesn't move, if it stays at rest, if it has an acceleration of zero, then there has to be, oops, a backwards pushing frictional force yeah, a backwards pushing frictional force like that. And that push has to be equal to the friction force since the net force has to be equal to zero. So we can model the magnitude of this frictional force. Uh, in this case, we call this the static friction force. And the model says that the static friction force is proportional to how hard those two surfaces are pushed together, which is the normal force in. Now there's less than or equal to right there. And that's because if I push just a little bit and it doesn't move, uh, and then I push more, it doesn't move. The, if the friction force is greater than the push, then it would start to accelerate. So the friction force, the static friction force, does whatever it needs to do to keep that block at rest relative to the table, up to some maximum point. There's also the kinetic friction. So if I once I get the block sliding and the two surfaces are rubbing against each other, then there's a different coefficient, uh, mu k. So we have two coefficients. Mu s is the coefficient of static friction, and mu k is the coefficient of kinetic friction. These are just models though, right? I mean, this says that uh, the friction doesn't depend on the speed, the friction doesn't depend on the contact area, uh, it just depends on this coefficient. And these coefficients mu s and mu k depend on the two types of materials interacting. So wood versus wood uh, rubbing against each other would be different than um, a, a car tire on asphalt or car tire on wet asphalt. Okay, so that's our friction model. That's what we want to do. Okay, so let's look at our first method. And I think this method makes the most sense to people. And it's basically just pull the block. So I have a block right here. I'm using this metal block. It actually goes on a, on a dynamics card. And I have it on a metal track, so metal on metal. I'm gonna pull it with this scale. And as soon as it starts to move, I'm gonna read the scale reading. Uh, and so right at that point, right when it starts to move, we're right at that maximum friction force. We're at the equal part of the lesson are equal to. And so we have this free body diagram where all the forces add up to zero, and so that makes it a little bit easier. We have the, the, the spring scale would have to be equal to the uh, frictional force. So whatever the spring scale is, is the spring, spring force. And then the normal force would be equal to uh, the gravitational force. So if we write this as Newton's second law in the y direction, it's not accelerating, so the sum of the forces is zero, n minus mg. Uh, and then in the x direction, some of the force is zero, so F spring minus Fs, and then I can just use my model at the maximum friction. The spring force is the frictional force. I have spring force, or frictional force, is mu times n, that's my model. Oh, that says k, that should be mu sub s. That's my, my mistake. I think you're okay with it, okay. So here's, here's what I do. I actually, this isn't the best way. Uh, I have a rubber band around that block. It's a 500, gram block and I can pull with the spring scale. I like the rubber band because it makes it less jerky because if you jerk it then you're going to get uh, a, a bad reading. So I'm going to pull this with one block and then I'm going to stack another block on top of that. And when I do that I increase the gravitational force pulling down so I increase the normal force but I didn't change the contact area. I didn't change the contact at all, the surface. I just uh, push them harder together and then three blocks, four blocks, five blocks, six blocks seven blocks. So I stack all those up there and I get, for every time I get a, a reading for how much it takes to pull that thing. And so here's my data that I got and you're covering, I'm covering up that last little piece. I uh, don't worry, it's 34.3. It, you'll see it in a second. So here I have the mass of the blocks I'm pulling. Uh, and, and from that I can calculate the gravitational force, which is the normal force. So I just multiply that mass times 9.8 and I get the normal force. And then the spring force is the friction force. So I have spring force which is friction, and normal force in. Uh, okay, 
So now I can plot that. So if I plot frictional force versus normal force, this is my data. And this is real data. I didn't do a really great job. I just did it, okay? I just did it the best I could. And I can fit a best fit line to that, and it looks like this. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. There's some programs that will fit a best fit line. You can make a program to fit the best fit line, but I just, I just did it. So if I have a linear function like that, then we think of the equation of a line as y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope, and b is the y-intercept. So in this case, I'm trying to plot friction force equals mu times n. And so I'm plotting friction force on the vertical, uh, normal force on the horizontal, so the mu s is like the, uh, the, the coefficient of friction is, should be the slope. That's what I was trying to say. Okay, so in that case, the slope of this best fit line is the coefficient of friction, and I get 0.151. And then let's just check. I have an intercept of negative 0.092. I mean, I could force that data to say, okay, the 0.00 is, is definitely true, and I'm not going to have any intercept. But I like doing it better this way so you can see what kind of... Uh, it, it's a measure of the, the error in your experiment. And it's not a perfect experiment. It's not a perfect line, but I'm pretty happy with this. Um, let me, I will note that this nice line isn't always a nice line. Uh, if you keep increasing mass, eventually this thing kind of levels out, which is kind of cool. You can kind of break the friction model. But for here, we're just going to stick with this is our coefficient of 0.151 with method one. Okay, method two. So suppose I put a block and I have it on a plane that's tilted. If I increase the tilt of that uh, plane to some angle theta, eventually it's going to slide. So right at that point where it's about to slide, all the forces add up to zero. So what forces do we have? Well, there's the normal force, right, which is perpendicular to the surface. So since the plane is tilted, the normal force is tilted. Normal force is not equal to mass times gravity. Okay, don't, especially in this case. Uh, and then we have the friction force pushing up the plane. So friction, static friction uh, pushes in a direction to prevent the object from accelerating, sliding. And so it wants to slide down, so the friction force pushes up. And then we have the gravitational force, which is straight down. So the next thing we need to do is to pick our x and y axis if I want to solve this as a, as a, a Newton's second law kind of problem. And, and the best option is here. Uh, you can do it either way, but if I pick x axis is up and down the plane and the y axis is perpendicular, then the only non uh, x or y force is gravity. It, you can do it either way. Okay. Now, if you have an acceleration, if it's accelerating down the plane, you definitely want to have x axis along the plane. Just that's another day, though, another day. So I have uh, x axis, y axis, and three forces. I can do, uh, oh, and also know this angle theta is the same as uh, the, the angle of the incline. A little geometry for that. You, you should be able to see that without too much difficulty. It's been done a lot of times. So the net force in the x direction is just that frictional force pushing up the x axis, and then a component of the gravitational force. So down here, this is uh, the component of the gravitational force in the x direction. And you'll notice that it's not zero because the angle is not zero. So it's, it's in fact uh, mg sine theta would give you this component. So add those two together and they have to be equal to zero. In the y direction, I have the normal force and then the, horse, the vertical component of gravity, which is the adjacent side right here, so that's going to be cosine. So mg minus cos, I mean, n minus mg cosine theta is zero. I can solve this for the friction force from the x direction. The friction force is mg sine theta. Uh, and then I can solve the y for n. n is mg cosine theta. Now I can just put this in my model for friction. So the coefficient of friction is right when it's about to slide. So this is the maximum friction force. And again, I put the k there. Oh well, that should be, it works either way. But uh, so that's the friction force divided by the normal force. So I just put mg sine theta divided by mg cosine theta. The mg's cancel, sine over cosine is tangent. So the coefficient of friction is tangent theta. Now, I see a lot of students just say coefficient of friction is tangent theta, and it's not necessarily wrong, but you should know where that comes from and how to get there. So <clears throat> let's do this as an experiment. Here's my 
plane and I have a little protractor there which I didn't actually use uh, and that string right here is attached to a mass. So I know the vertical direction. Now I'm just going to raise that plane up very very slowly until the block just starts to slide and then I'm going to come back down and do it again and so I can get more than one reading uh, and I kept doing that uh, and I can measure the angle. You could measure the angle by looking at the string but I didn't do that. Um, I instead used that video and then I use tracker video analysis to actually measure the angle between the vertical and the track. And then I can find theta uh, as the leftover, 90, the complement of that. Uh, so doing that, I get theta as about 7.9 degrees. I average those. Uh, and then tangent of 7.9 is 0 0.139. And that is my coefficient. It's a little bit different, and I'm okay with that. I didn't do the best experiment, uh, but this method does work fine. Okay, method three, I love this one, tipping over a block. And I saw this from one of my online friends uh, and I, I, I wanted to do it. So if I have a block right here and I, I stood it up just to make it work and I push right here, it's just gonna slide, okay? But, or, or not move. But if I push higher up, it's actually gonna tilt over, okay? And so I wanna find the point at which it, it's right transitioning between sliding and tipping. And that point I can find, I can use to find the coefficient of friction. Okay, so I have my block and I'm pushing it. It's just about to tip over. It's right at that tipping point. So I've adjusted the vertical axis until it's just tipping over. Uh, in that case, I have the downward gravitational force, the pushing, the pushing force, and then I have the normal force. Now, if it's just about to tip, the normal force, I'm gonna deal with rigid body equilibrium. I need to put the location of each force. So the, the gravitational force acts at the center mass. The normal force could act anywhere, but if it's just tipping, it has to be over there on the edge. And then also the friction force. It's a contact between the block and the table, but if it's just at the tipping point, it has to be over there on that edge. So now I can uh, use my Newton's second laws. Oh, I, the, the width of the block is W. The height of the block is H, which actually doesn't matter. And then I'm going to call this a distance up the block S for where I push it. So in the, if I add up the forces in the X direction, it has to be equal to zero. So I have the push and the friction, the friction force pushing this way, and the push pushing that way, and they have to add up to zero. In the y direction, I have the normal force and the gravitational force. They have to add up to zero. That's easy. And so from the y direction, n is equal to mg. From the x direction, the push has to be equal to the friction. But remember, if it's at the maximum point, friction is mu times s, mu times n, and then I know n is mg. So I get the push is mu s mg. But I don't know the value of the push, right? If I did, then it'd just be the same as method one. So now I can look at another condition for equilibrium, which this says that the sum of the torques about some point O is also equal to zero. Um, and I'm using the scalar version of torque instead of the vector version because it will work fine here. So I had to pick a point about which to calculate the torque. So let's pick this corner right here. That corner is really nice because those two forces exert no torques because they pass through the point. So I don't have to worry about them. So that means I have the torque due to the gravitational force and the torque due to the push. Now, if you, if you look at the gravitational force, it, well, I guess it wants to make it rotate uh, counterclockwise. So that'd be a positive torque. The push force wants to make it rotate clockwise. So that'd be negative. So remember, torque is... Uh, the force times the perpendicular distance to the, the point. So for, uh, for the gravitational force, it's the force, mg, and then the distance to the point is just this w over 2, It's because it's halfway, it's the center mass. For the push, it's a distance s away, so whatever that measurement may be. So I have mg, w over 2, the torque due to gravity, minus fps, that's the torque due to the push. And now I can solve for... Uh, FPS, it's just going to be MGW over 2, but remember, FP was mu s mg, so if I substitute that in, I get mu s mg times s, 
and now I can just solve for the coefficient of friction. That's it, right? Notice that the gravitational field cancels. That's kind of cool. Mass cancels. So I just get the width divided by twice the height. So that's kind of cool. Um, also, you'll notice that what if uh, it was very wide block, if W was very large, uh, you're not going to tip it over unless the coefficient of friction is greater than one, which it normally is not. So that's why. Okay, so now let's do this. So here's my block. I'm gonna push it at different places. You can see it slides down there. I, I had to tilt it straight up. Uh, and I'm gonna keep pushing it until it tips over. And then I moved it back to the center. And I'm, I wanna find that one location right there, right about somewhere around there. So then I'm kind of finding that, that just moving it back and forth until I can find that position. Now to measure that, I again use tracker video analysis. Now I know the, the length of the, of the whole uh, bar, I can use that to scale my, my video. And then I can use, once I know the scale of the video, I can measure the height from the bottom. Uh, and I get the width of the whole bar is 2.45 centimeters and the distance up is 8.8 .8 centimeters. So I'll just put it in. The units don't matter because they cancel. Right? I don't have to do it in meters because I have uh, distance over distance. And I get uh, 0.139, which is very similar to the second method. Now, it's off a little bit from the first. I'm not really sure why. I think what happened is my later data points, I got really bad results. Those spring scales that I use, I like them because you can see what's going on, but they're not necessarily the best. Probably much better to use a force sensor, and I think I could get better ideas. But I'm, I'm trying to show you... Uh, how you would do this. So three ways to measure the coefficient of friction. That's that.